Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. All right, so welcome this morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we are delighted that you're here to worship on spring break, right? But no better time to worship, right, than on spring break. That means you should be rested. Some of y'all going, what's spring break? I didn't get a break this week, so I understand. Well, we're glad that you're here. I, I wonder if any of you have ever experienced this. Um, have you, any of you ever called, uh, like you walk outside and, and it's hot in your house and you're wondering what in the world is wrong, and you walk outside and your air conditioning unit, I'm asking for a friend, by the way, your air conditioning unit is frozen solid and you wonder what in the world's wrong so you call you call the hvac guy he charges you 165 dollars an hour he comes out looks at your air conditioner and then he can find nothing wrong and he looks at you and says have you checked your filter this is uh okay good i got some honest folks in the house because we, we you know I, a few times that's happened around here this is the litter this I, i'm embarrassed to admit this but this is the filter out of our house yesterday this is what it's supposed to look like how many of you know if the, if you don't have the right filter in place it can mess you up see the filter is supposed to catch the impurities and block some things filters keep some things out and keep some things in and what we're talking about right now we took a week break because we had Pastor Warren in. Anybody enjoy that last week? Yeah, if you missed that, you missed it. But we took a week break, but we're, now we're back in it because we're saying that in order for us to live like we're supposed to live as followers of Christ, we must have the right filters in place. And so I'm concerned because I think a lot of us have lost all of our filters. Now, don't touch your neighbor at this moment. I know I have y'all touch your neighbor a lot and say some stuff, but don't look at your neighbor right now because you know I'm talking about them, not you. Most of us have lost the filters we need. So we started by saying we'd lost our filter of silence. We didn't know when to keep our mouth shut so that God could work on our behalf. So we've been practicing. Anybody been practicing that over the last two weeks? All right, good. So let's keep going because I need us to check our filters. Join me in 1 Samuel, if you will. Well, chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 30 through 33, I'm going to read some highlights to you of an account that many of you know. If you don't know, I'm going to catch you up. 1 Samuel chapter 20, beginning in verse 30. Saul was furious with Jonathan and yelled, You're no son of mine, you traitor. I know you've chosen to be loyal to that son of Jesse. He's talking about David. You should be ashamed of yourself, and your own mother should be ashamed that you were ever born. You'll never be safe, and your kingdom will be in danger as long as that son of Jesse is alive. Turn him over to me now. He deserves to die. Why do you want to kill David, Jonathan asked. What has he done? Now listen to this. Saul threw his spear at Jonathan, his own son, and tried to kill him. Then Jonathan was sure, well, I guess so. Somebody throws a spear at you, kind of helps you make up your mind quickly, right? Then, then Jonathan was like, duh, I get it finally, that his father really wanted to kill David. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, listen to what happens. Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. And when the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him, and he became crippled. Uh, I'm going to come back to this because I've never seen this before, but he was already crippled at birth. Now she drops him, and it says he's now crippled ag again. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Second Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 3. Then the king, this is David. Then king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If Saul want to show God's kindness to them. And Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. In Lodibar, Ziba told him, at the home of Maker, son of Amiel. So David sent for him and brought him from Maker's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. And when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. And David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you, listen to this, because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. And Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? 
Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and to his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat, always eat, here at my table. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Come on, everybody say Mephibosheth. You know you want to. Yeah, uh, okay, all right. Y'all said thither last week. I'm bringing you Mephibosheth, all right? So, so if you don't know this account, here's what happens. Uh, in, in, in historical fact, you can look it up for yourself. Israel has begged for a king. They're not like all the other nations. God is their king. They beg for a king, and God finally relents. Sometimes we ought to be careful what we ask for, because sometimes God gives us what we ask for, right? So God gives them a king. He handpicks, hand selects a young man by the name of Saul. Saul ascends to the throne of Israel. He's now God's representative on earth, and he's leading. They go into battle. It's a routine battle against the Philistines. The only problem is the Philistines had a trick up their sleeve by the name of Goliath. Goliath shows up. He's a giant. And Saul tucks tail, stays in his tent. None of the men want to fight Goliath Goliath, because he's huge. And when all of a sudden a little shepherd boy by the name of David shows up and wins the mighty victory that we all talk about, right? So now Saul recognizes David, brings David into the palace. And because of David's success and all the victories that he won, Saul becomes suspicious of David. And the Bible says that over a period of time, Saul throws his spear at David three times. And so David starts running. The only problem is is that Jonathan was also on the scene. Jonathan is Saul's son. Jonathan is the heir apparent. John is the ki- Jonathan is the king in the wing, right? I mean, if something happens to Saul, Jonathan's supposed to ascend to the throne, correct? Because he's the king's son. The only dilemma is, is that uh, for some reason, Jonathan and David hit it off. And they become very close. In fact, they become so close that the Bible talks about how they make covenant with one another. Your enemies will be my enemies. My enemies will be your enemies. What, what belongs to me belongs to you. And they are loyal to one another, even to their own demise. And so now we get into this account that I read to you. Jonathan sitting around a dinner table with his dad, Saul. Saul has invited David. Mm-hmm. He's been chasing him, but he's invited him to come and eat. I think he's got a plan, right? And so David doesn't show up. And Saul asks his son, where's David? And Jonathan covers for him. It's an interesting story. I don't have time. You ought to go read how he covers him. But he finally covers for him. And Saul erupts in anger, picks up a spear, and throws it at his own son. Right? It's a me- Y'all think your family's dysfunctional. This, this is like Jer's, Jerry Springer ready, right? So, so, um, so now... You fast forward and what you discover is that Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle. Correct? David now becomes the new king. God appoints him, anoints him. Samuel goes, you know the story, tries to pour his oil on all of David's brothers, but he came and finally pours the oil on David, anoints him as the next king, right? And so David ascends the throne. And then this is what happens. David... Uh, normally, if you act like all the other kings in the region, this is what should have happened. David should have gone through the land and killed all of Saul's descendants because when you're new to the throne, a new family comes to the throne, you want to get rid of all the old family because you don't want there to be any misplaced allegiances and you don't want there to be any coups rise up. You don't want there to be any challenges to your kingship, right? But instead, what happens is David says, is there anybody still alive from the household of Saul, that I can show, listen to what he says, show, show I can show them God's kindness. And the report comes back that there's this young man. And so based on the covenant that he has with Jonathan, David says, bring him to my table. So he sends for this young man. The report comes back that this young man by the name of You just wanted to say it, I know. (laughs) He comes back that he's living in Lodibar. I don't have time to mess with this. Lodibar means, the the word means no word, no pasture in a dry place. Let that resonate with you in a moment because that's what happens when we have no word in our lives. It creates dryness in him. And so they go and they bring him and they take him to the king's table. And he sits at the king's table for the rest of his life and his brokenness is covered. 
the manner in which David handles Jonathan's son illustrates for us the next filter that I think as followers of Christ we must reestablish because I'm afraid many of us have lost it. We desperately need to go back and reestablish and reinstall the filter of grace in our lives. If we as followers of Christ do not have a filter of grace in our life, then we become like the uh, parable that Jesus told in the New Testament about the man who was forgiven a large debt. I went and looked it up. In today's equivalent, he had a debt that he owed to somebody of about $40 million. And the guy he owed the debt absolved the debt completely. And Jesus' story goes like this. Once his debt is resolved, $40 million that he would never be able to pay off, he leaves that situation and goes into another scene where there's a man that owes him the equivalent of 68 bucks and he chokes him by the neck and throws him into prison demanding that the man pay his $68 fine. That's what we look like when we as followers of Christ do not have a filter of grace in place in our life. And so what I want to do just for a few moments this morning is I want us to go back and just for a second and talk about what grace does. What does it do for us? And then I want to talk about who we should offer grace to. So let me help you. I want to remind you, just as a reminder, this is just a reminder this morning, that grace covers completely and grace covers comprehensively. Okay, you're going, well, big deal. Okay, so Mephibosheth is dealing with with layers of brokenness. Okay, so I need you to remember, he was already lame, and then at five years old, the word goes out that that, king, that, that David is, is probably the new king and that they're probably going to wipe everybody out, and his nurse picks him up and drops him, and he's crippled again. Okay, stay with me now. He's injured even further. He's been crippled from birth, and now he is further crippled because he has been mishandled. But when he arrives at the king's table, Right? I read it to you. When he arrives at the king's table, his previous condition and his current condition are covered. See, we've lost the filter of grace. We don't even understand how important that really is. In other words, our filter of grace should make room for people at the table that were broken and those that are still broken. Yeah. See, too many of us are only willing to deal with, we're only willing to offer grace to, to some of the people around us because, only because by the time we come into relationship with them, they've already dealt with all of their issues. And because we didn't have to deal with their discrepancies and their deficiencies, we're willing to offer them grace because they've already cleaned up. Some of you are willing to offer people in this room grace simply because they're all nice and neat now. You didn't meet them when they were broken before, and so now you're willing to offer them grace. But God's kindness is complete and it is available to those who have been wounded and to those who are still wounded. Yeah, yeah. See, see, yeah, grace makes room for those who are healed and for those who still need to be healed. We must become people who are just as graceful for people in their current condition as we were for their past condition. Yeah, so, so the good news this morning is that our brokenness does not disqualify us from sitting at the king's table. Never will. The, the, what we've got to come back and understand is the only thing that disqualifies us from a place at the table is if we forget to be full of grace. So, so, so it, it's complete, but here's, here's another term. I, I, I added this late because I, I just feel like, like um, the insurance folks in the room would appreciate this a lot, Mike. Uh, so, uh, so, so God's grace is comprehensive. You say, well, what, what are you trying to say? See, liability insurance only deals, gives forgiveness for what I do. <laughs> okay, yeah. It only covers my mistakes. Like, if we go out of here and I only have liability insurance on my car and I hit you, it's going to cover my mistake, right? But if you hit me, it doesn't cover your mistake. God's 
great. We like to deal with God's grace like liability insurance. It's good if it just takes care of me. I really don't care about you. I don't care about the fact that you, you hurt me. That's not my it. That's your, you got a problem because I only have to deal with what. No, God's grace is comprehensive. That means it makes up for what I do, but it also gives grace for what you do. And what I am challenging you to do this morning as a believer, as a follower of Christ, to reestablish the filter of grace comprehensively so that you will allow the grace of God to deal with not only your mistakes but make room for the mistakes others make as well. Yeah. So so it's complete and it's comprehensive but God's grace is, grace also covers continually. I want you to notice the, the proclamation that David makes. He says, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will always eat here at my table. In other words, there is no end to grace. Can't get no help. It is continuous. There is no expiration date on grace. David gives Mephibosheth continuous grace so that he gets to he gets this place where he gets his favor back. He gets his food back. He gets back to his feet in a metaphor. I'm using a metaphor. He gets back to his feet, if you will. He, he gets back to the palace. He gets back to his position. Grace As believers, followers of Christ, grace should be our fallback position. But because we have uh, no, no filter, it seems like grace is the exception. And if it's not the exception, listen to me, it's short lived. I I just came by to remind somebody that that, that needs to get the grace of God, get a, a clear view of the grace of God that's been extended to you and that we should extend to others, that God's grace, God's grace, he is, he's willing to wait on us. He's willing to be patient with us. Anybody recognize that the Bible says that God is long-suffering? I I don't know if you're thankful this morning, but I'm thankful that God has more patience than I do and that God is long-suffering, right? But now let me challenge you. We are supposed to mimic him. Because grace is is something where, where we have to be willing to go over and over and again and again and believe the best about people again and again. Over and over, continually. Uh, Some of you are uncomfortable right now. We need to give people the benefit of the doubt. Over and over. Okay, so so we should handle carefully, repeatedly. We should handle carefully, repeatedly. (laughs) God's grace is continuous. Our grace should be continuous. So, so, so let, me, let me come to this, and, and, and then I'll get out of your way. I also want you to know, recognize that God's, or, or that grace is connected. I, I want you to hear this. I want you to see this. I, I think there are many. I could go into, you know, I've got all the Bible dictionaries you've got. I, I got Google just like you got. I could, I could, there are a lot of accurate, succinct, clear definitions of grace. I could ask some of you for the definition of grace, and you could probably give me a really good one. But I, I, I think maybe the definition of grace that we need to capture today is the definition of grace that David gives. When David says, I want to show Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth God's kindness. Oh, See, so you missed it. He wasn't, David didn't say, I want to show him my kindness. He didn't say, hey, bring that guy in here. I want to show him my mercy. He, he, never, he never says, hey, bring him in here and let me show him any of that. He says, bring Mephibosheth in. Here's the defini- definition of grace. And let me show him God's kindness. He, he was literally showing. See, David understood that the actions that, that he was taking in that moment were literally revealing God's kindness or grace. And I want you to notice something very clear. I've never really thought about this before. David extends God's grace to somebody he doesn't even know exists. Go back and read the story. David had to ask, is there anybody? Apparently he had no clue that Jonathan even had a son that was crippled and living in Lodi Bar. He didn't know who he was, didn't know where he lived. And all of a sudden, David, listen, Mephibosheth was not David's favorite. Mephibosheth, David wasn't close to Mephibosheth. He wasn't David's preferred. 
He didn't have a clue who he was. But I want you to notice this. I want you to notice the reason that David extends Mephibosheth grace is this. He extend, I'm, going to say this the same, I'm going to say the same thing a bunch of different ways. I want you to catch this. He extended grace because of his relationship with Mephibosheth's father. David literally gives Mephibosheth the place of a son at his table out of respect for his father. One more time. David's grace is connected to David's relationship with Jonathan. Listen, one more time. He loves the son because of his relationship with the father. One more time. Mephibosheth receives unmerited favor because David was connected to his father. You say, well, big deal. Grace is, should be and always will be connected to our love of our Father. Therefore, listen very carefully, we should offer grace to anyone who is loved by our Father. If our Father loves them, I should love them. If my Father favors them, then I should favor them. If my Father will welcome them to the table, then I should make room for them at the table. And I think because we've lost the filter of grace, we reserve grace for people we prefer. And we reserve grace for people that we like. And we reserve grace for people that we know. And we hold grace back it's only for people that we're close to when David shows us that grace is for anybody that our father loves and so out of my respect for my father I should be willing to offer grace can I just be honest with you for just a few moments there are some people that bother me <laughs> there are some people in this world that get under my skin and I'm getting ready to list all their names and some of you are in here and I've been waiting for this message for months because I wanted to call you out. No, there, there are some people that rub me the wrong way. Anybody else? So who do we offer grace to? You know why I can offer those people grace? Because I recognize, like David, I've discovered that how I treat people determines how they see my God. Mm. I'm going to say that one more time. Even when they rub me wrong, and even when they upset me, and even when I don't prefer them, and even when I don't like them, and even when they're from a different political agenda, and even when they got stuff they say that just I just don't like, I still can offer them grace simply because I recognize that grace is connected, and I offer them grace because I want them to understand. Because as they're watching me, they're determining things about my God. It's connected. So, 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 so we got to know something this morning. I need to, I need to help you. Just, just buckle in for just a moment because I mean, it's going to get rough up in here for just a moment. I, I, I just need to remind you that spiritual growth, yes, it is vertical. But I also need to remind you that spiritual growth also has a horizontal component. And some of you are killing it in your relationship with God. That's the vertical. The only problem is, is that although you're getting along with God, you can't get along with anybody else. Because you have no filter of grace. Okay, I knew that. So, so, so what happens is when we don't have a filter of grace, could I just, can I let you in on a secret? When we don't operate with a filter of grace, we unpreach. We unwitness. We, 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 we undo every attempt that God is making to bring that person to the king's table. Can I just help you this morning? You are God's PR team. You are his resume. <laughs> you are his business card. You ought to walk into work tomorrow and say, here's, here's God's business card. I just showed up at 9 a.m. You're his business card. People determine things about God by watching you. And so it's time for us to recognize that to whom much is given, much is required. And it's time to recognize that in this moment, at this hour, on the scene that we're on, for such a time as this, I believe it, for such a time as this, we must be the most great, graceful people on the planet. Get your filter back. Recognize that God is the judge. You are his representative of grace to help people see the goodness and the kindness and the love and the mercy of God. I don't like them. Doesn't matter. You don't get to pick. If God loves them, you got to love them. 
Yeah, some of us never operate in grace. We are gruff and we're hard to deal with and we're rigid and we're unyielding. And we would say, that's just the way we are. I just want to tell you, that's the way we were. That's not how we're supposed to be now. If we've been given the grace of God, then we are supposed to have experienced the goodness and the kindness of God. And now we give it back to those around us. I just want to invite you this morning to reestablish a filter of grace. And what does that look like? It means that we take, we take very seriously. We, uh, we, we invite the broken and the messed up and the less than perfect and less than preferred people and invite them to our table. But when they get there... We cover them. That's grace. We cover them and we make room for them. The grace, why? Because the grace we offer is not offered based on our relationship with them. It's, ra- it's, it's based entirely on my relationship with my father and their father. Our treatment of those at the table can't be based on their worthiness, their wholeness, their righteousness. No, it is literally based on the one who set the table and the one who brought us to the table. Here's the truth this morning. I just need to share this with you. We've all been dropped. Uh, uh, y- 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 y'all missing it. Let me, let me help you. I, I, I just need to show you what, what I'm talking about. So, so uh, uh, Tari, come here. Get your chair, Tari. I got you, Tari. I got you. Because I want you to come to my table, right? I, I, I know, I know. I made you work too hard. I should have offered you some, I'm going to offer you some grace. Sit right there. Right. So I'm at my table, and Tari is coming to my table. There's only one problem. Tari's a Tar Heel fan. And I don't, I don't know if I can offer grace. No, this is true. So, 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 he's at my table, but, but he's, he, maybe he's not preferred because he's a Tar Heel fan. Let's go one step further. Tari is a Star Wars fan. And how, how can I offer to let him sit at my table when he's a Star Wars fan? I don't know, I just, I, I, here's, the, here's, the, here's my point. We've all been dropped. We all have brokenness. I'm at the table and I'm covered, but I can make room for his Tar Heelness and your Star Warsness, right? Because I love my father and my father loves him. See, y'all were expecting to say we had a whole bunch of other differences. They can't figure it out. They'll figure it out later. They're so okay. There's some things about us that aren't the same. The least of which is Tar Heel fan and Star Wars fan. But there's room at my table for Tari because I know my father loves him. And so whether I prefer him or not, whether I understand him or not, I got to make room for him, right? So, so where, where is uh, Gary Grace? We, we got to use somebody with the last name Grace on a sermon about grace, right? So, so come here, Gary. So see, some of y'all are willing to offer. Come on, you, you, you can sit at our table too. See, some of y'all don't know Gary. So y'all, y'all see Gary now. Gary's all cleaned up and nice now. But do y'all know he was once in prison? Yeah. He killed 42. No, I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. You know why he can come and worship with us? And nobody knows until I ask him permission, by the way. That nobody knows that because he's at my table. And at my table, even though he's been hurt and he's been dropped, I recognize it's not enough for me to be covered. I need to cover him too. This happened a long time ago. That's all right. Grace is sufficient comprehensive right it's complete yeah yeah where's jeremy parker come here jeremy parker see some of y'all like yeah i got i got somebody else i want to invite this is old jeremy right here some of y'all don't know jeremy jeremy's a, a good dude if you hadn't met jeremy you need to you need to meet jerry jeremy's jeremy's at my table i like jeremy he's he's into stuff i'm into right jeremy would be one of my preferred people right here's the deal y'all don't know this about jeremy but jeremy's uh I don't know, director of Hope Center in Bethany, right? Is that right? All right, I got it right finally. I just give him all kinds of names, right? But what y'all don't know is the reason that Jeremy has a heart for the men in Hope Center is because Jeremy was once an addict. He's fully recovered. 
God saved him, set him free. You would never know that. Why? Because we just keep covering him. He's welcome at my table, right? Yeah, my story. Listen, I can offer him grace. I did, my story's not his story. It was, it's alcohol, right? That, his, was, his was alcohol and drugs, but I've never even had a drink. Not one sip of alcohol has ever passed my lips. I've never taken any drugs. You say, well, you can't relate to him. You, you should stay away from him. He will corrupt you. No. Grace. I love him because my father loves him. Yeah, yeah. So, Sir Bradley. Bradley is in the Hope Center. But let me just tell you something. Bradley, you're welcome at our table. You're welcome at my table, and we will cover you. That doesn't mean you'll never make a mistake. Doesn't mean they're not going to be bad days. But grace is comprehensive. It's for your past offenses, and it's for, it's for what you're going through right now. You are welcome at our table. My question is, who are you making room for at your table? Because there are people at your job and at your school and in your neighborhood that aren't like you. They like Star Wars. They've got problems from their past. They've got a history. They've got current issues right now. And some of you are trying to avoid them and stay away from them. And you don't represent God well to them. Please, would you reestablish the filter of grace on your life? Because you're representing our Father to them. And could now your prayer become this? Not God, I need your grace. Some of y'all have had a lot of grace from God. But let's change our prayers a little bit this morning. I don't want to pray anymore. God, will you give me grace? Let's start praying like this. God, I'm thankful for your grace. Now, will you help me offer grace to those around me that don't look like me, believe like me, act like me, live like me. Let me offer grace to them. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Would you stand to your feet this morning? So, so you're saying, what do we need to do? I'm asking you, please check your filter. When somebody comes along in your life, and it will be in about 45 seconds. I'm going to go longer than that. It will be in the next three minutes. When Pastor Andrew comes and closes us out, you're going to walk into somebody in the lobby that you don't prefer. If it doesn't happen here, it's going to happen as soon as you pull out of the parking lot. There's going to be somebody that's going to pull up beside you and they're going to say something. You're going to go to a restaurant and they're going to be doing stuff you wouldn't do. And you can sit all over by yourself and say, I'm so thankful for the grace of God in my life that I'm not like them. I can take you to a passage of scripture in the New Testament where Jesus deals with that whole attitude. So now, instead, could we just make a prayer, a corporate prayer, individual prayer this morning that God will apply, apply the grace of God in our life so that we come to this point. So now we walk through life with a filter of grace. And when they're espousing things we don't believe, and when they're saying things we don't like, and when they're acting in ways that we don't approve of, could instead, I'm not talking to you about polishing over sin. We're called to call sin, sin. But I can tell you this, Every time that Jesus told people they were sinful, they were drawn to him. Why is it that when we tell people they're sinful, they want to run away from us and think that God's like that? Let us reestablish a filter of grace this week where we handle people with the grace of God, the same grace that he's given to us with, a, with, with, with honesty and a broken heart. We look at them and go, my father loves them. My father loves them. And so I must too love them with every. Father, I pray in Jesus' name this morning that what you would do in this house in this moment is I pray that you would allow us to reinsert, reestablish, pick back up the filter of grace. I pray for every person here this morning that you would touch our lives and cause us to recognize the kindness that you've shown us. We ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you say, Steve, my issue is I need grace. I've been dropped. I feel broken. I feel less than. I'm limping through life. And I need the grace of God for my life right now. If that's you, would you just raise your hand I need His grace. Yeah, I'm struggling right now a little bit. Yeah.
thought that might be the case. So put your hands down, put your hands down. Would you do this with me? Because we're about grace, would you just reach over and put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder? You don't know if they raise their hand or not. We're just gonna believe for grace for each other. Father, in Jesus' name, for every person that raised their hand in the building or watching online, if they are in a broken moment, this could be a brokenness from years ago or it could be a current condition. I pray that the grace of God would be applied. We offer them grace. We make room at the table for them. And so, Father, I pray that you would strengthen them in their broken condition. And I pray that you'd bring them back to the king's table. Let them recognize they're welcome in the goodness of God in this moment. So we lift them up and we ask you to touch them and bring healing and wholeness to them in this moment. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray for everyone here. Some of us are not even sure we want this filling. Some of us are so convinced that we're always right and that our opinion's the only one that matters, that we're not real good about even wanting a filter of grace. I fall in that camp sometimes, God. I ask for me and for every person under the sound of my voice that you would change our filter this morning. Our filter's clogged up with a lot of stuff right now. And I pray that you give us a brand new filter of grace and remind us that we have been given the grace of God. And now, in turn, we give it to those that deserve it the least. We don't have to know them. We don't have to like them. We don't have to prefer them. We simply need to make room for them and represent you well. I pray that you would allow us to become people of grace. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.